Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Luke chapter 7. We're going to be talking about the faith of the centurion. Jesus raises a widow's son from the dead. Jesus and John the Baptist. And Jesus anointed by a sinful woman, a so-called sinful woman. So let's start at verse 1. After he had finished speaking in the hearing of the people, he entered into Capernaum. A certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick at the point of death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and save his servant. When they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly saying, He's worthy for you to do this for him, for he loves our nation. Notice, they, they beg Jesus. I mean, Jesus, it seems like he's not so apt to jump on this, you know. So they have to beg him. Uh, and they're saying, he's worthy for you to do this for him. So the, they, are, they are appealing to this man's works, uh, his uh, works of good deeds and his uh, character uh, for to be worthy of, of this miracle. So he said he loves our nation. So he loves Israel. He's worthy. Uh, and he built a, our synagogue for us. Now, Jesus went with them. So Jesus here, it's, isn't this interesting that Jesus did not say Oh, building a synagogue, don't worry about, you know, bringing that to my attention. That, I'm not going to heal him, you know, for that reason. Oh, well, you know, loving, loving the nation of the Jews, the Jewish nation. Oh, don't even bother bringing, bringing that up, uh, bringing that topic up because, you know, I'll, I'll heal him. Uh, you know, it's, it's not even, that's not even part of the equation. Jesus didn't say any of that. Jesus just heard what they had to say, and went with them. So, uh, continuing in verse 6, When he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent, sent friends to him, saying, saying to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Oh, all of a sudden, now when Jesus is very close, uh the centurion sent friends to Jesus saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. So isn't this remarkable? Let's go back again to verse 3. Uh, let me see. Let's go back to verse 2. A certain centurion servant who was dear to him uh, was sick at the point of death. Uh, when he heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and save his servant. Okay, so it was the elders of the Jews that came to Jesus, begged him earnestly, saying, He is worthy for, him to, for you to do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he built our synagogue for us. Now, but Jesus comes, you know, basically under that pretense or under that uh presupposition of this man is worthy of my attention. He loves the nation and he is, um, you know, he built a synagogue. And so when he's close, uh, the centurion himself uh, sent friends saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. So the, the servants apparently used this whole thing, uh, what would you call it? Almost like a bargaining piece, a negotiating, uh, a negotiation uh, tool saying, this man's worthy. Uh, he is worthy. He loves our nation and he built a synagogue for us. But then the man himself said, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. So that's interesting because Jesus had no problem with them using the, the man's deeds for a, 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 you know, a good reason for him to come. Uh, but as he came, uh, the man himself was, was not proud. He was very humble, saying, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Verse 7, Therefore, I didn't think myself worthy to come to you, but 
say the word and my servant will be healed. In other words, don't even come under my roof. Now, again, I want to bring to your attention, when people came to Jesus for healing, when people came to Jesus for, uh, for mercy, uh, it wasn't just like coming to, coming, coming to some, you know, hippie out of the 60s, some love and grace guy that would go around hugging trees and just hugging everybody and kissing them and, 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 and telling everybody how much that he loves them. No, this man, Jesus, Hebrew name uh, Yeshua, was such a powerful man, such a holy man, that, again, Peter himself, as we read earlier, uh, said, Lord, depart from me. I'm too sinful for you. Okay? This centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should even come under my roof. Okay? Don't even come under my roof. Don't... you. I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. So just don't even bother coming. Just say the word. That's all. And my servant will be healed. So consider this, that there was a persona. You might say some people might call it an aura. Some people might call it a, um, what would you call it now? Just the characteristic of Jesus that um, was so powerful that people fell down at his feet and worshipped him. People, uh, when they came to him for mercy, they had to have uh, come with the heart of great repentance and humility. They couldn't just come like how people do today to say, oh, pray for me. You know, uh, no, uh, they must have come in a very, very humble state. They must have, I mean... I spoke with a pastor um, several years ago uh, that was talking about the difference between today's so-called charismatic prophets and the prophets of old. Uh, the prophets of old speaking about, let's say, you know, 100, 200 years ago, even those who were considered to be prophets of God. They said that when a prophet were to come into town, uh, people wouldn't, wouldn't even dare go to that meeting without repenting of their sins first because if they did, they were afraid that their sins would be called out. In the same way, if that's how powerful and holy it was in the days of old, when it came to the prophets, even charismatic, so-called charismatic Pentecostal prophets, if that's the way it was with those guys, how much more with the Lord himself? You couldn't just come to him, especially in the context of asking mercy of him, uh, wanting something from him, uh, wanting him to heal you or do some great miracle or save you, whatever, without coming to him in complete contrition and repentance and, um, you know, without first cleaning up your life as much as you can, <laughs> you know. And just coming to him in complete humility. Um, that's that's the context. Now there there are a lot of you know miracle uh, evangelists today that that just hold meetings and they want to have great crowds and stadiums and auditoriums full of people and praying for the sick and wanting them to be healed and they're and they're praying that everybody in the service will be healed that everybody will be healed all will be healed. But, I mean, they're praying for what, what happened in the days of Jesus, but they're not putting it in the right context. They're not preaching hard against sin like Jesus did. They're not preaching hard against hypocrisy like Jesus did. They are just um, basically just, you know, calling for people to come so that they could get healed, go home and get blessed. Oh, God loves you. God blesses you. And that's it. I mean, so no wonder these, no wonder the charismatic church is in the state it's in today. Um, we have to come back to the real root and the real persona of Jesus. And that is a persona of pure holiness and power. So this centurion, again, let's uh, 
last part of verse 6, said to the Lord, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Therefore, I didn't think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man placed under authority, having under myself soldiers. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. So what the centurion was saying to Jesus was basically, listen, I understand authority. I'm a man of authority. I'm under authority. I know how authority operates. You know, the, it's by the word, okay? It's by a word. You say a word and it is done. I get a word from my authority, I, I do it. You know, I give the word to those under me, they do it. I know that you are a man of great power and great authority, let alone great holiness, because I'm not even worthy for you to come in my house. Uh, so just give the word. Just say it. That's all I want you to do. Just say it and my servant will be healed. Verse 9, When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the multitude who followed him, I tell you, I have not found such great faith. No, not in Israel. Wow. And this is a Roman, uh, I mean, a centurion. This is a centurion here who was... Uh, uh, you know, a man that really wasn't known to be a very religious man not at that. I mean, uh, he's not like a priest or something like that. But Jesus said, I tell you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Verse 10, those who were sent, returning to the house, found that the servant who had been sick was well. Soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain. Many of his disciples, along with a great multitude, went with him. Now when they came near to the gate of the city, behold, one who was dead was carried out. Oh, they're having a funeral. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. I want you to pay attention to that fact. It's, I mean, it's not just by accident they say he's the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. You see, in those days, women did not work at all. They had to rely, if they were a young girl, they had to rely on their father for their livelihood. Uh, when they were married, they had to rely on their husband for their livelihood. If their husband passed away, they would have to rely on their son to, to look after them and care for them. This woman was a widow. She did not... Uh, you know, apparently she did not have a father to look after her. She did not have a husband to look after her. She only had her only son, one son that would look after her. And this is where all of her livelihood, came, you know, come from. I mean, they didn't have government checks back then. So that only son died. So basically that was pretty much a death sentence for her as well. Who else would look after her? Who else would be the breadwinner of the family? Who else would bring home the food that she needs to eat and, cl and, and, the, and the clothes that, need, that, that she needs to wear to fix her house so that she may have shelter? So this was a very, very sad situation. She had only one son, and then that son died, and she, her father died, her husband died. She had nobody. Let's continue with the last part of verse 12. Many people of the city were with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Okay, so this is a motivating fact. Okay, this is the motiv a motivating factor uh, with the Lord. Some people, I mean, some theologians say that Jesus did miracles just to authenticate his ministry or miracles were done just to, um, you know, to authenticate the Bible, the scriptures, that kind of thing. Nah. The script, the miracles were done here, especially in this particular case, for one and for one reason and one reason only. For one motive and one motive only. The only motive the Lord had was compassion 
on this poor woman who lost everything she had in regards to livelihood. Nobody was there to look after her. Verse 14. He came near and touched the coffin. That's Jesus. And the bearers stood still. So the ones who were carrying, the pallbearers, the ones who were carrying the coffin stood still. He said, that's Jesus, said, Young man, I tell you, arise. He who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he gave him to his mother. Fear took hold of all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. This report went out concerning him into the whole of Judea and in all the surrounding region. Verse 18. The disciples of Yochanan, that's John, told him about all these things. John, this would have been John the Baptist, calling to himself two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the one who is coming? Are you the one who was coming? Or should we look for another? Now, isn't this remarkable that John would would do such a thing? It was John that introduced the world to Jesus saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes the takes away the sin of the world. It was John who prepared the way for Jesus. It was John who said, I'm not worthy that he should even, you know, untie my, my sandals. Verse 20. When the man who had come to him, when the man who come to him Uh, They said, John the baptizer has sent us to you, saying, Are you he who comes, or should we look for another? Now, again, why would John be asking such questions? Wouldn't he be, you know, continuing with the message of this is the Lamb of God, this is the one to come, this is the one, this is the one. Now, At this point in time, he was in prison. John was in prison. Can you imagine the feeling of John being in prison? Knowing that Jesus is just outside. Knowing that the scripture says that when the Messiah comes, he will release those who are in prison. Hmm. Knowing that there were times when God did mighty miracles for uh, for people and... Uh, and and delivered them out of the hands of those who persecuted them. But the Lord himself was right outside, and, I mean, more or less, uh, right outside, and, and yet Jesus didn't... Uh, maybe he was thinking to himself, why doesn't Jesus come to me and release me? Why doesn't he come and uh, and do a miracle and get me out of prison? Well, why doesn't he come and speak to Herod? So all these questions could have been weighing on John. But apparently this was God's will for John. Verse 21. In that hour he cured many of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and to many who were blind he gave sight. So Jesus answered them, Go and tell John the things which you have seen and heard. Okay? You're you're first-hand witnesses. You are first-hand witnesses. You go tell John what you have seen first-hand and what you have heard first-hand. That the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the have good news preached to them. Blessed is he who finds no occasion for stumbling in me. Hmm. So the very sta- the very same passage that talks about the Messiah being one that frees those who are in bound in prison is also the passage that talks about the Messiah who will you know. Uh, 
release those who are um, bound in, 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 in the sense of being blind. They will receive their sight. The lame will walk. The, you know, the poor will have uh, the, the good news preached to them. So Jesus was ba- basically kind of making sure that John understood. No, listen, we're on track here. We're on track. Yes, I am the one that is to come. I am the one. Uh, I am the Messiah. And this is proof. You you have seen it and you have heard it for yourself. You got firsthand witnesses. And again, verse 23, he said, Blessed is he who finds no occasion for stumbling in me. Why would he say such a thing? And what does this mean? Well, the word stumbling means sin like or offense, okay? Uh, if you are offended, Offended, you you stumble, so to speak. And this is this is this is Bible language. This is Bible lingo. Okay, if you're offended at me, uh, basically, I I I give you occasion for stumbling. Okay, that's basically what it means. If I if I cause you to stumble, it means you're offended at me, or I cause you to sin in in in, in a way. So, uh, verse twenty three: Blessed is he who finds no occasion for stumbling in me. Meaning you are blessed if you do not get offended at me. If you find no sin in what I say, okay, in who I am. Why would Jesus say that? Because he wasn't this lovey-dovey hippie kind of guy. He went about doing good works, yes. He went about doing miracles, yes. But only in the context of, and in many cases after, preaching hard against sin, hypocrisy. Preaching righteousness, preaching holiness, preaching be perfect in the eyes of your Father. So, yeah, it is... uh, Many people were offended at Jesus. Many people were. They tried to kill him time and time again. We read just a few uh, few chapters ago how they 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 wanted to throw they wanted to catch arrest him or catch him and throw him off a cliff. Uh, you know, one uh, one uh, preacher said. If Jesus preached the way that a lot of pastors preach today, he would never have been crucified. Okay? If Jesus preached the way that a lot of pastors do today, he would never have been crucified. Because a lot of pastors preach today the way they preach, a lot of evangelists and priests and pastors and bishops and even the Pope, you might say, or whatever. They sugarcoat everything. Oh, God loves you. God accepts you. All this kind of stuff. That's not the way Jesus preached. Not. Again, he called people sons of Satan, sons of hell. Oh, and by the way, not everybody is a son of God. Not everybody is a child of God. Jesus called them sons of Satan in, in John chapter 8. You can't be a son of Satan, a child of Satan, and also be a child of God at the same time. God, no, it just don't work. That's far from the truth. The farthest from the truth. The truth is there are many children of Satan, few children of God. Okay? That's the truth. Jesus said, broad is the way, wide is the path, and many... By far, most people are on their way to destruction, hell, judgment, condemnation, eternal torment. But straight and narrow is the path. I'm talking about the path that's hard to travel. Jesus said, few there be that even find it, let alone walk on it. Hmm. Blessed is he who finds no occasion of stumbling in me. Blessed is he who does not get offended at what I say because there are so many people who do get offended with what Jesus said and who Jesus was and how he preached. Verse 24. 
When John's messengers had departed, he began to tell the multitudes about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft clothing? In other words, beautiful, you know, top-of-the-line clothes? Behold, those who are gorgeously dressed and live delicately are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and much more, much, much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. That's Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. For I tell you, among those who are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the baptizer. Wow. What a statement. Think about all the people that were born of women. Think about all the great prophets of old. Could that even include Moses himself? Mm. Probably not, but, I mean, hey, this is what he said. Among those who are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the baptizer. Think about who John the baptizer was. He was a man who came and just told people to repent of their sins. Told them to get right with God told them they basically they were going to hell. He talked about the eternal fire of hell, the chaff that will be burned with unquenchable fire. He talked about how Jesus would condemn people to hell. He talked about that. Yes, he did. Jesus could have said here, again, look at what could have happened. He had, all, I mean, here he is. He's in the context of talking about John the Baptist. He's got time to talk about John the Baptist. He could have said, well, John the Baptist, he had a good message, but, you know, he was a little bit harsh. I don't think he really was a real good representation of God's love. He could have said that. Remember, the Lord said, I am the Lord, I change not. And that is also found in Malachi. I change not. God doesn't change because he doesn't... He's beyond time. Uh, time exists outside of God. He He created time. Uh, if he needs to change, then he's subject to time. If, if God needs to change, then that means that he must have did something wrong before. I mean, no. He, he is eternal and solid and as secure as you can get. He, doesn't, he never needs to change. Never changed and never would ever change. So Jesus could have said, well, John the Baptist, he was a little bit rough around the edges, but hey, he had a good, he had a, you know, he was okay, but I, you know, now he's gone or, you know, now his ministry's ended. So we're, we're, we're going, we're moving on now. No, he didn't say that. He said, for I tell you, among those who are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in God's kingdom is greater than he. In other words, if you want to be like John the Baptist, you've got to be very, very humble. He was least. you got to be humble. You've got to get rid of all natural human pride. Verse 28. Excuse me, verse 29 when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they declared God to be just, having been baptized with John's baptism. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, lawyers in those days would have been those who were the, the ones who were specialists in Torah, specialists in the law. The Pharisees and the lawyers, that would be the teachers of the law, rejected the counsel of God not being baptized by him themselves. 
Now, in verse 31, the Textus Receptus, it says here, adds, but the Lord said, To what then should I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another, saying, We piped for you. We played music for you, and you didn't dance. We mourned. We mourned. We cried, and we told sad stories, and we, 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 played, we had a pity party, and you didn't weep. For John the baptizer came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you said he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. In other words, feasting. Basically, it's just a um, just a way of saying he came, you know, in a in a very joyful state. So he's talking about uh, again, again, to step look back a step here. Jesus is saying they're like children who said we played a, a happy song, but you didn't dance. We played a sad song, and you didn't weep. John the baptizer came neither eating or drinking, and you didn't weep with him. I come eating and drinking, which means I come and happy. John the Baptist came with more of a sorrowful note, and you didn't, you didn't, um, uh, you didn't mourn with him. I come with more of a happier note, and you don't, you, you don't dance with me. But you say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Wisdom is justified by all her children. Meaning, true wisdom is shown by the works, the fruit of your life, not just your words, not just what you see in a person just in a few minutes here, a few, few minutes there, a few hours here, a few hours there, a few days here, a few days, a few days there. But you will know true wisdom by a person's lifestyle. You will know whether or not they're truly repented. You will know whether or not they're truly, you know, sincere or truly wise. Not just on the surface. You know, oh, I met them on the street. They seem like they're good now. Uh, well, you might want to give that some time. Wisdom is justified by all, by all her children. In other words, it's the fruit of your life that testifies about you. Now, I, I... I feel a need here to touch on this as well. Okay, so this is the the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they said, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard and a, fr a, ta a friend of tax collectors and sinners. That's what they said about Jesus. What do they say about John the Baptist? He has a demon. I'm here to tell you all the above, okay, is false. It's all false accusations. It's all nonsense. It's all lies, okay? John the Baptist didn't have a demon. Jesus was not a glutton. Jesus was not a drunkard. Actually, we have no proof that he even drank anything, even grape juice. Like I said to you before, I believe uh, that there are there is sufficient evidence in the scriptures to conclude that Jesus himself was under the Nazarite vow, uh, according to the Book of Numbers, which means he doesn't he didn't even uh, he wasn't even allowed to touch. Uh, a, basically to eat anything from the grape or drink any grape juice, even eat, you know, um, grape skins. Um, and, and that is, uh, again, I, I've, I've touched on that before. I'm not going to go into detail in this, in this particular session about that. But no, John, uh, John the Baptist didn't have a demon. That was false. Uh, Jesus wasn't a glutton. That was false. Jesus wasn't a drunkard. That was false. He didn't even. He didn't. That's the reason why he didn't even touch the 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 fruit of the vine at the in the Last Supper, I believe, because he was under that vow. He was. Why wouldn't he be? That vow was the most holy vow to take. Uh, why wouldn't he be under that? Why wouldn't he fall into that uh, category of being taking the Nazarite vow? Like again, I got a lot more to say about that, but there's a bug in your ear. He wasn't a friend of sinners, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Oh, oh, I know some of you be like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, that's totally wrong. Listen, listen. We just take it. Hold on a second. You know, the scripture says, don't answer. Don't draw conclusions before you've heard the matter. It's foolish. Fools draw conclusions 
and, and come to assumptions and presumptions uh, before hearing the entire matter. Okay? Uh, when you sue somebody or in a, in a court case, the court has to hear the entire story of each side before they draw a conclusion. You can't just, a court never, a judge or a jury would never just hear one side. They would always say, okay, that's one side. Let's hear the entire story from the other side. So having said that, again, what I said earlier, to come to Jesus, there's only two ways you can come to Jesus. Number one, with, with a devilish attitude, which a lot of the uh, people did in those days, uh, testing Jesus, wanting to accuse him, uh, wanting to find something wrong with him, um, mocking him, whatever, okay? Or the other uh, way to come to Jesus is for something from him, mercy, um, healing, forgiveness, anything like that. Now, again, there's plenty of evidence that shows that Jesus was such a holy man, such a powerful man, that people could not come to him, the second way, could not come to him for mercy, for miracles, without completely putting aside all humility, all, I mean, all pride, I mean, all sin, putting aside all pride, all sin, and coming to the most holy man that ever lived in humility and in contrition. Okay. Um, listening to his words, his words were strong. His words were pointed. His words caused people to get angry. Yes, they did. Um, you couldn't come to him without some significant degree of repentance, uh, especially if you wanted some something from him. Um, and these so-called sinners uh, came to him for that, for mercy, to hear the words of life, for miracles. You know, uh, again, consider Peter himself. Didn't even said, Lord, you're too holy. I can't even don't even, I I can't even stand your presence. Depart from me. The centurion we just read about, Lord, you know, I'm not even worthy that you were to come in my house. Okay, so those people who came to him was willing to listen to him, who wanted something from Jesus, had to have been repentant. There is a huge difference, my friend, between a sinner and an ex-sinner. This is what the Pharisees did not understand. This is what they did not, this is what did not compute with them. If you used to be a liar and now you're not, then you, you're not a liar anymore. That's what you used to be. If you used to be a thief and you've repented and now you're not a thief, well, now you're not a thief. I mean, how more, you can't get it any simpler than that. You used to be, but now you're not. So these people, um, Pharisees and the teachers of the law and such, saw these so-called sinners coming to Jesus. They did not. They did not see. They were blind. They did not see that these sinners have repented. This is what what they did. You know, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago, or whatever, was what they used to be. Now they've come to the Holy Lord, Lord of Glory. They've come to the Lord of Glory, and they have repented. They're not sinners. They are ex-sinners. They used to be. Okay? Some people say, oh, it's impossible not to sin. Not true. Do you think God is such a harsh and a harsh tyrant to give you commands and that you cannot obey? Not true. Uh, even those who do go by, let's say, the 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 the, the law of Moshe, the, the law of Moses, you, you talk to some of the um, dedicated, you know, staunch Orthodox Jews today, and ask them. Have you fulfilled all the commands? And I'm pretty sure almost every one of them, if not every one of them, would tell you, yes. Yes, we have. As much as, you know, as much as we can, to the best of our ability, we have. 
Uh, and that is all that's required of God, okay? God doesn't require, require you to do something that you cannot do. Otherwise, he would be just a very, <laughs> it wouldn't be a very good person. It wouldn't be a very good God at all to command you. What? Who of you, being parents, would command your children to do something that is absolutely impossible to do? Say, if you don't jump without assistance and land on the moon, without any kind of assistance from any kind of machine, if you don't jump and land on the moon, I'm going to kill you. Which one of you parents would do something like that? In the same way, God would not say, if you don't obey these commands, and that's it, you're dead. You're, you're condemned. He wouldn't do that because he gives you commands that you can obey. And in con again, and this brings out a whole new uh, topic. And this is, what does God require you uh, of you? What part, like how much, how should we interpret the Torah? Uh, how should we obey the Torah? How can we be Torah observant? And my friend, it is very, very possible. In fact, it is easy. According to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, at the end of the Torah of Moses, um, it, I mean, God wrapped it up by saying, this is easy. It's not hard for you. It's easy. You have no excuse. I'm not asking you to go up, jump to the moon. I'm not asking you to d dig to the very core of the earth. It's right there. It's right there in front of you. The kingdom of God is at hand. You can't be in the kingdom without being under the king. And you can't be under the rule of the king without being under his rules. And again, I know this goes into a whole big thing about uh, law and grace and faith. We'll get to that, okay? We'll get to that. When we get into more of Paul's letters, we will get to that stuff. So hang in there, okay? Hang in there. Again, don't be a fool and judge me without completely hearing everything that I have to say about the subject. Uh, if you do, <laughs> the Bible says you're a fool. <laughs> it's just what it says. Okay, so yeah, let's go on to verse 36. One of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. Okay, now, was Jesus so irate or so much of an enemy of the Pharisees that he said, oh no, I'm not going to go into your house. You're a Pharisee. I condemn you. You're a Pharisee. You're a bad man. I'm not going to come to your place. Jesus didn't say that. It says here he entered into the Pharisee's house. I am I'm amazed at how many Christians today, you know, they're you know, they're more accepting of sinners than they are of the righteous. Anybody who is righteous or preaching righteousness, preaching, you know, to obey God and all this kind of stuff, a lot of times they call them Pharisees. And it's like it's like the worst thing you can ever call somebody. It's like, you're a Pharisee. Well, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to follow Jesus. You're supposed to listen to Jesus, take his example, and follow his example. He accepted the invitation of the Pharisees. It says here he entered into the Pharisees' house and sat at the table. Not only did he go to the Pharisees' house, but he made himself at home. And this brings us to another point. And I'm... I, don't read anything into this, but I just want to bring this out to you, that some people believe that Jesus himself was a Pharisee. Oh, <gasps> really? Yeah, some people believe that because of the fact that he hung around them so much. He was around them so much, and he went to their house and all that kind of stuff. Um, we know that Paul, the apostle, uh, was a Pharisee all of his life. We know that at least two-thirds of the so-called New Testament was written by a Pharisee. There's nothing wrong with being a Pharisee as long as you're not a hypocrite, which a lot of Pharisees were. Not all, but a lot were. Paul wasn't. Uh, Nicodemus was another Pharisee uh, that Jesus preached to. Okay, and Apparently, he could have gotten saved and he could have been a great Pharisee, a good Pharisee. There, is a good, there are good Pharisees. They may be few and far between, but they are. There are good Pharisees. 
verse 37. Behold, a woman in, in a woman in the city who was who was a sinner, when she knew that he ha, he was reclining in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. Now, isn't this interesting? This woman was not is was a sinner. She was allowed to come into the Pharisee's house. Hmm. Now, here we are in the Pharisee's house. Not in public sphere, not in public. This was in the Pharisee's house with Jesus himself and the woman who was, was a sinner. If she was, at that point in time, if she was currently a sinner, why would the owner of the house, I mean, let's say, for example, if she was a prostitute, why would the Pharisee allow her in, in the house? She was a sinner, and apparently she repented, okay, which a lot of Pharisees don't understand. Well, so when she knew that he was reclining at the Pharisee, in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of ointment. Standing behind at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with, her, with the hair of her head, kissing his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would have perceived who and what kind of woman this is who touches him, that she is a sinner. Oh, is a sinner. This is Again, this is what the Pharisee said. Okay, So the narrator of this whole uh, story, back in verse 3, which would have been Luke, said the woman was a sinner. Uh, the Pharisee said in verse 39 that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, teacher or rabbi, say on. A certain leader had two debtors. Or excuse me, a certain lender had two debtors. The one owed 500 denarii. Now, we know a denarii is about a day's wages. So 500 would be about, you know, hey, that's quite a bit. That's over a year's wages. A year and a half, year and a third. And the other, 50. Okay, that would be like four years, right? Oh, excuse me. The one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. 50 would be a little less than two months' wages. When they couldn't pay, he forgave them both. Which one of them would, will love him the most? Simon answered, He, I suppose, to whom he forgave the most. He said to him, You have judged correctly. See, it's okay to judge. <laughs> um, ver, uh, verse 44, Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. Wow. Again, what kind of man was this Jesus? He wasn't just some ordinary man. He wasn't just some lovey-dovey, you know, love-all, tree-hugging hippie. If that was the case, why would a woman come before him and cry so much that he, basically she washed his feet in her tears? Listen, he was a king, a king of kings. He was holy, the most holy. As it says, you alone are the most holy. You alone are holy. The most holy God. Jesus said in 45, you gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to, to kiss my feet. Hmm. Since the time I came in. Sounds like that woman was already there at the house. Hmm. Or at least she arrived at the same, around the same time, basically. Verse 46. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. You didn't, you didn't anoint my head, but she anointed my feet. 
Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But one to whom little is forgiven loves little. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Today, shalom. Shalom Aleichem. So that concludes uh, Luke chapter 7. I pray this was a wonderful blessing to you. And again, if there's anything I said in this chapter that uh, doesn't sit quite right with you, hang on there. Just hang on. Don't get turned away. So many people get so turned away on just so many frivolous little things, okay? Don't do that. Uh, My friend, we're in a battle. And uh, we need to uh, be unified in holiness, in righteousness, in faith, in truth, and in the Lord Yeshua. So as you go, may God bless you and show you great and mighty things. God be with you in your pursuit after him and in your walk in righteousness. Thanks again.